See? 
kings of the world receive our prayer. You are seated at right hand of the Father, and mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit in the glory of God.
blessed us with all the spiritual blessings of heaven in Christ. Before the world was made, he chose us, chose us in Christ, to be holy and spotless, and to live through love in his presence, determining that we should become his adopted sons through Jesus Christ for his own kind purposes, to make us praise the glory of his grace, his free gift to us in the beloved in whom, through his blood, we gain our freedom, the forgiveness of our sins. Such is the richness of the grace which he has showered on us in all wisdom and in insight. He has let us know the mystery of his purpose, the hidden plan he so kindly made in Christ from the beginning, to act upon when the times had run their course to the end, that he should bring everything together under Christ as a king, everything in the heavens and everything on earth. And it is in him that we would claim as God's own chosen from the beginning, under the predetermined plan of the one who guides all things as he decides by his own will. Chosen to be, for his greater glory, the people who would put their hopes in Christ before he came. Now you too in him have heard the message of the truth and the good news of your salvation and have believed it. And you too have been stamped with the seal of the Holy Spirit of the promise, the pledge of our inheritance, which brings freedom for those whom God has taken for his own, to make his glory praised. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Many of you here this 
morning will be familiar with the film franchise Mission Impossible, which was spurned from a television series in the United States of America in the 1960s. And then subsequently a number of films have been made and I'm told that there's the last one in this current franchise is due for release towards the end of this month of July. Mission Impossible. We might say that if we wanted to summarise both the first reading today that we've heard and the Gospel passage, we could summarise them by the title Mission Impossible. Why is that so? Well, let us for a moment reflect upon our first reading from the book of the prophet Amos. At this time in the history of the people of Israel, there were two nations nations that the people of Israel had split into the southern kingdom of Judah that was based on Jerusalem and there was a northern kingdom called Israel and their place of reference both politically and from a religious point of view was the temple at Bethel, Shiloh. And our focus then is on the northern kingdom of Israel. Now Amos came from the south he was not of the northern kingdom, he belonged to the kingdom of Judah. And he had an awakening through God speaking to him that he must go to the northern kingdom and prophesy to those people. The northern kingdom itself was having a time of great prosperity. It was a time uh, when everything was working out well, both commercially and economically. The people had never had it so good. So why did God raise up Amos then to go up and prophesy in the northern kingdom? Along with their prosperity also came the development of what is technically referred to as syncretism. That is, allowing other religious practices that were foreign to the people of Israel to infiltrate into their religious life. This had come about principally because the king of the northern kingdom, Ahab, had married a woman called Jezebel. And Jezebel was a foreigner. And she brought with it her, her gods, and in particular, the god that was referred to as Baal Mankart. Baal Mankart. And she promoted the worship of this foreign god at the temple, as the temple priest in the shrine in Bethel. It was, of course, a foreign intrusion. That was the first reason why Amos was sent. The second reason was because, despite their prosperity, those who had become rich and powerful took it as an opportunity to be able to exploit those who were poor and on the margins. In other words, there was extraordinary social inequality going on. And Amos preached against what he saw as being a corruption of God's justice. Amos is often known as the prophet of social justice. Now, when he came to the Northern Kingdom to preach and to set forth his prophecy, he was very unwelcome indeed. And our passage that we had from the prophecy today is when he's taken to task by the priest of the shrine there at Bethel, Amaziah, who basically says to Amos, Nick off, we don't want you here. You don't belong here. You don't come from our country. You don't belong. Go back to where you came from. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? And Amos says, no, no, you misunderstand. I am not a professional prophet. I'm not here to rival you. When I was in Judah, I was simply a vine dresser and a dirt farmer. And God is the one who's raised me up to come here to tell you that you have to amend your ways. You have to get rid of the false gods. You've got to stop exploiting those people who are poor and on the margins, and you have to start to live according to covenant living. 
the way that you were taught to live through Moses and the prophets. Mission impossible. Indeed. But Amos was not deterred because Amos had with him the power of God and the force of God through God's prophetic word. He was not to be deterred. Now contrast that to the gospel. Jesus' fledgling disciples had been with Jesus from the beginning of his Galilean ministry. They had walked with him, they listened to him, they observed him, they had seen him in action, they had seen the results of the proclamation of the good news of the kingdom of God. They had seen people have their sins forgiven, they had seen people be raised up from sickness and paralysis, they had seen people who had been possessed of evil spirits being cleansed and returned to their rightful minds. They had seen all this through the action of Jesus, but now Jesus is sending them out in order to do exactly what he was doing. They now had to be the ones to engage in the mission. And they went out without any resource save the example of Jesus himself. Mission impossible? I bet you they felt that way. They probably felt very inadequate and not up to the task. Oh yes, they observed Jesus, but they weren't Jesus. How on earth could they engage in this sort of mission? In trust and in confidence, they went out and they carried out the work that Jesus had instructed them to do. And we are told by Mark, so they sent off to preach repentance and they cast out many devils and anointed many sick people and with oil and cured them. In other words, mission impossible became mission accomplished. They succeeded in what they were meant to do. Why? Not through their own resource, but rather through the resource of Jesus. St. Paul, in the second reading today, when he writes to the church in Ephesus, in that very wonderful lyrical passage, explains that each and every one of us has been chosen and called in Christ before the world began. That we have a purpose and we have a meaning. And the purpose and meaning that we have is that the grace that we receive through our belief in Jesus Christ is to be translated into action in the world in carrying on Christ's mission. And in that wonderful passage, Paul goes on to explain that it is through the grace that we have received through Christ that we are able to share that with others. In other words, the mission of Christ is not over. The mission of Christ has been entrusted to us who have been baptised into Christ in order that we might go and set the downtrodden free, in order to lift oppression from those who feel oppressed, in order to bring about peace and reconciliation in the lives of those who feel blighted and overwhelmed in the world in which we live. Christ's mission today is entrusted to the church. We are the church. It is entrusted to us. That's what we are called to do to accomplish that mission. It is not an impossible mission if we believe that we are going forward in the name of Christ and empowered by the spirit that has been given to us in baptism and that is refreshed and renewed every Sunday when we gather around this altar in order to receive the very body and blood of Christ that sustains us as food for the journey of our lives. That's why we do this. That's why we come here, in order to rekindle what was given to us in baptism, so that we might be effective agents of Christ in the world. My dear friends, this is not mission impossible. It is mission possible. And it is mission possible only through the person of Christ. As long as we remain connected to Christ sacramentally, this mission can be achieved. And it is the mission that's entrusted to every single person in this church this morning.
not just to me, but to all of us, all of us who are entrusted with this mission. And that is what we are called to do. So, that's our challenge this week. Not impossible, possible, but only in the strength of what we gain here from this altar. Love, I have called you and you. 
sacrifice which you yourself have provided for your church, and granting your love and kindness to all who partake of this one bread and one chalice, that gathered into one body by the Holy Spirit, they may truly become a living sacrifice in Christ and the praise of your Lord. <coughs> Therefore, Lord, remember now all for whom we offer this sacrifice, especially the servant Francis, our Pope, Vincent, our Bishop, and the whole order of bishops, all the clergy, those who take part in this offering, those gathered here before you, your entire people, and all who seek you with sincere heart. Remember also those who have died in the peace of your Christ, and all the dead who spake you alone would know. To all of us, your children, grant your merciful Father, that we may enter into a heavenly inheritance with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, and with all your apostles and saints in your kingdom. There, with the whole of creation, free from the corruption of sin and death, may we glorify you through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the Lord all that is good. Say the word, my soul shall be healed.
this is very busy here. Uh, bigger general basically means, as I told the last mass, that either he does the bidding of the bishop, or the bishop does his bidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, he'll be here with us next week. So thank you again. Justin. 